Wildfires have forced tens of thousands of people to leave their homes in Orange County. USC students are among those who had to evacuate. Posting selfies with your ballot is cute, but it could also be illegal. We'll learn more about the laws behind ballot selfies. Our wellness segment, BRB, is back. This week, learn how to take a break and join us for a mindful moment. Live from USC, you're watching Annenberg TV News. Tens of thousands of people in Orange County are being ordered to leave their homes as flames inch closer. The Silverado and Blue Ridge fires are threatening thousands of homes. I'm Zoe Ginsberg reporting from Los Angeles. And I'm Ella Katz reporting from Manhattan Beach. An Orange County supervisor is asking Governor Newsom to declare a state of emergency. With fires blazing just an hour south of USC, about 100,000 Orange County and Riverside residents have evacuated their homes. Two firefighters have suffered serious injuries. High winds started the brush fire at around 1 o'clock in the afternoon. The fire broke out in the west end of Riverside County, but quickly spread into Orange County, blackening the skies. About 100,000 people that were evacuated, primarily in Southern California. Currently about 90,710 are currently evacuated uh, in the state. Most of those evacuees are in non-congregate shelters pursuant to our COVID-19 protocols. Uh, most of them are in settings that allow people to isolate, uh, focused on their health. Packing up and leaving everything behind is already stressful enough, but especially during a pandemic with finals right around the corner. We checked in with three evacuated students to see how they're holding up. I received the first alert around like 9.30. But, well, that's, that's when I started to like pack up everything. I just like loaded everything in my SUV until Urban PD came to my house and just knocked on my door and said, okay, you have to go. I already sent out an email to my professor saying that, oh, you know, I'm like, I was in the moving and I'm not really sure whether I, I will have like stable Wi-Fi connection. And my professor was so considerate and caring. Everything happened really quick. So we, the, the fire started yesterday afternoon and by night we were fearing that we need to leave. Uh, you can kind of feel that pe some people are panicking. Like for example, yesterday I was trying to go get gas just to like make sure that if we're like, we're ready to go if we need to. And it was just like huge lines. For our neighborhood was like the very first, from what I know, the very first neighborhood to evacuate. B needing to evacuate during COVID is also another thing. Like, obviously it would not be ideal to be at our grandparents' house. You know, they're of an older age and they've been quarantined. And like, it really brought all of us together. And I think like, that's what I was thankful for. In Orange County, more than 76,000 people have been ordered to evacuate. The fire has burned more than 11,000 acres and is only 5% contained. In Riverside County, where the fire began, more than 2,500 people have been told to evacuate and more than 15,000 acres have burned. As of this afternoon, the fire is 0% contained. I'm Isabella Bright on Politics. With only one week until Election Day, youth votes are expected to reach record highs. Despite obstacles of limited drop box locations, COVID-19, and lines wrapping around polling locations, young voters are determined to make their voices heard. Americans are getting their votes in early despite the long lines. A new Harvard Institute of Politics poll revealed 63% of young adults indicated they will, quote, definitely be voting. Voter turnout and political involvement of young adults has already surpassed that of the 2016 election. We spoke with an expert on voter turnout and a Gen Z activist on the youth vote. We saw that um, high percentages of young people not only say that they are going to participate in the election, but also express a high level of confidence that their voice matters and that they have the efficacy, they have the power to change things in this country. And that's really important because when young people feel like their voices matter and that they can make a difference. They're so much more inclined to participate. You know, I think that young people have always been organizing, so I don't think it's anything new, but I think more young people are organizing. So you see like Black Lives Matter protests, you see protests about climate change. Um, I think the issue is that young people don't trust our government and they have every reason not to, um, given like what's been happening, what, what has always been happening. If you look at like the history of our country, you know, it has never 
for example, serve people who look like me. More than 1.2 million voters between the ages of 18 and 21 have already cast their votes in 39 states. You may be seeing some of your favorite celebs posting selfies with their election ballots. We talked to a legal expert and a social media expert about the ethics and impact of ballot selfies. Uh, the reason that was made unlawful in some states, and it's not unlawful everywhere, um, was to make sure that it was a little bit harder to buy someone's vote. One of the ways to make a vote buying scheme effective is for me to pay you and then demand that you show me a picture of who you voted for, precluding pictures of ballots or images of ballots, uh, puts a little sand in the gears of a vote buying transaction and makes it much less reliable. People are changing with respect to how closely held they want their ballot choices to be private. Uh, I think that Younger generations generally have a very different notion of privacy. Celebrities have influence on everybody. And to normalize voting, to know that people who are celebrities, people who are regular Joes, that everybody votes is just a really cool thing. Absolutely think it's important and it's a great way to get people to turn out the vote. And if they've requested a ballot, haven't turned it in yet, it's a super reminder. As you can see, in some states, including California, ballot selfies are legal. Be sure to check your state's laws before posting on social media. Now, back to you, Zoe. Justice Amy Coney Barrett was sworn in to the Supreme Court last night, cementing a six to three conservative majority. The change has panicked many women who are afraid that this may negatively impact their reproductive care rights. Some students are motivated to take action. They don't want to lose access to safe abortions and resources from organizations like Planned Parenthood. More and more states are aggressively regulating abortion, and I would anticipate that we would continue to see, the, at a minimum, those types of issues come before the court. But it wouldn't surprise me at all if there will be a, a facial challenge to uh, a woman's right to choose as a constitutionally protected right, and that it's an opportunity for, for sort of activism, but it's gonna be activism not at the court level, it's gonna be activism at the legislative level, it's gonna be activism at the executive level. If slash when I go into reproductive rights advocacy and law, rather than spending my professional career fighting for increase in access and expansion of programs and services, I might be spending my entire professional career fighting for, you know, the very basic needs that shouldn't need to be fought for anymore. My mom is super passionate about reproductive rights and abortion access specifically, and I have a picture on my desk of her um, at an abortion rights rally when she was in college. We're going to be doing the same thing that my mom was doing 30 years ago, which is insane to me. The Supreme Court is expected to hear a case that could affect the future of the Affordable Care Act after the election. The ACA provides reproductive health care to millions of women. Oh my goodness gracious. When she's not pampering pets at her grooming salon in Malibu, Sherman Balin is caring for 76 rescue animals at home. Animals are Balin's greatest passion, and she takes in just about any animal that needs help. Pigs, cats, goats, there's no job too small or big. So I try to hang on to everybody I can that has medical issues because a lot of people don't want to take that in. I mean, they say Trump is obese at 244 pounds. He should run for president at, at his weight. Balin is anxious about the upcoming election because she feels the biggest threat to animals is another four years with President Donald Trump. This guy, again, does not believe in the science. He doesn't understand what it looks like to look out on a horizon to see an animal. He sees condos. They see oil wells. It's something that hits close to home for Balin, who lived through the devastating Wolseley fire that ravaged Malibu over two years ago and burned down many houses, like you can see behind me. She worked tirelessly through the fire to rescue animals, and thinking about that time still shakes her to her core. We lost so many during the, during the fires. The carcasses, the, the bodies leaned against the fence that were burnt. I always want to be able to see a touch of wildlife because hopefully I affect them and they definitely affect me. For Balin, it helps to talk about these subjects with someone close to her. Her confidant and partner in liberating animals, Mel Soboleski, has become her election season sounding board. 
What I like about Sherman is I could go to her and vent, and if I'm wrong, she gives me the truth. I trust her implicitly. I know that, you know, her best interest is always for the animal. Balin says both parties must come together in order for real change to happen. She thinks her presidential pick can do just that. Jill Biden has been known for reaching across the aisles, not pandering, but reaching. Listen, I've got one hoof in the grave. All I care about is that you kids have a future. Like many things this year, the future of Sherman's place is uncertain. But one thing she does know for sure is your vote counts. For Annenberg Media, I'm Genevieve Glass. A petition to extend the deadline of the pass-no-pass no pass grading option has been circulating online. It's in response to an announcement from President Folt that the university would only grant the option up until the last day of classes. Three students shared how they feel about the university's decision. I felt there was a lack of recognition that we still haven't completely adjusted to, to Zoom. It's like something else I have to worry about. It's just like a confusion. Like, do I do, do I pass? Do I not pass? Do I ask my professors, like, do you think I'm going to pass? Are they going to think I'm slacking off if I'm asking them that? I feel like it was necessary to have those same standards that you did in the spring. Nothing has really changed. Even though the fall semester might not be a disruption to our learning like the spring semester was. There are all these ongoing struggles which show that there is a need to move the pass no pass deadline till after a finals. Grades shouldn't be the most important thing. Yes, we should work hard and continue to do our best, but at the same time all these circumstances are limiting us and we shouldn't be penalized in the future when someone's looking at our GPA. The university did not respond to our request for comment. The deadline for pass no pass remains November 13th for all undergraduate students. Craig, we are in the middle of a fucking play, and you behave like this. This is just a small taste of a film created by a team of USC SCA students. The film takes place in 1993 and explores queer love and the AIDS epidemic. It was supposed to be a capstone project, but after USC announced classes would be online this semester, the team decided to drop the class and make this film on their own. We spoke to the producer and director about their decision to go at it alone. I believe that if the school is not offering its students the educational experience that they wanted, that they should go independent. And it's very easy to get into that trap where you get so caught up with um, you know, the, the excitement of having a thesis or the excitement of being in this position um, where you realize that, you know, with virtual education, it's, it's not the same experience that they were offering. When we're doing SCA productions, we're kind of in this bubble because SCA did already, like already, SCA ha has already done a lot of the works for us. But if we're doing an independent project, we have to like sort of navigate and figure out all of these like necessary procedures on our own. The team has plenty of challenges to overcome beyond not having USC resources. Two of the team members are working from abroad, but Anti-Venom Forest Snake is scheduled to begin production in December. The Dodgers are on the verge of clinching their first World Series championship in over 30 years. But how Dodgers fans react could impact the number of COVID cases and how LA County plans to continue reopening. We spoke to a few Dodgers fans and a health expert about how fans should celebrate this potential victory and react accordingly. There's other people that I have to be concerned for and just going to watch, watch games with a hundred random strangers at a bar, for example, that you would normally do is just, it's not worth it at right now. But yeah, having the Dodgers win one during the year of the pandemic would be would be great. I think everybody should celebrate safely, take precautions, and get tested. It's inevitable that you're going to want to celebrate with family and friends if we do win the championship, when we do win the championship. But please be safe and don't spread it and get tested. So I think what everybody should should do is is kind of anticipate what could happen and plan accordingly. Don't leave anything to chance, you know, choose one other family or one other household um, that you know is, is kind of pretty safe in terms of, um, you know, how they behave and plan to have a watch party with just those rather than at the last minute, you know, go looking for an, 
a restaurant or a you know a bar, even if it's outdoors, because I think things can very quickly escalate. The recent rise in COVID cases may be due in part to large gatherings and watch parties held when the Lakers won the NBA championship. According to the LA County Department of Public Health, the average number of daily cases has increased from around 940 to almost 1,200 per day since early October. These are the LA County guidelines for public celebration and private gatherings. Food must be served in single-serve disposable containers. The host household of the private gathering should collect names and contact information of all attendees in case contact tracing is needed later. These gatherings are limited to two hours or less and limited to three households, including the host and all guests. I'm Jillian Carroll reporting from Los Angeles. The LA Dodgers head into game six of the World Series tonight against the Tampa Bay Rays. Tonight's starting pitcher, Tony Gonsolin, had this to say about his mindset. Uh, you know, I've had a lot of time to prepare and it feels like I've, I'm back on like a normal routine like I had all season. I try not to put more pressure on myself than there already is. Um, you know, I try to go out there and throw the ball to the best of my ability and, uh, you know, nothing changes tomorrow. Dodgers fan and Annenberg alum Tyler Meyerly traveled all the way to Arlington to experience Game 4 of the World Series. She spoke with me about what it would be like for the Dodgers to bring home another championship to L.A. this year. To get a Lakers win under our belt, to get a um, L.A. Dodgers win under the belt, you know, I'm not sure if they'll get a football one, but, you know, when you can get two sports championships, and bring them back home. I, it's what the city needs. It's what we need this year. And it would just, it would be really special. As the Dodgers wind down the World Series and hope for a win tonight, the college football season is on its way back to LA. Let's send it over to Ava Brand for an update on USC football. Thanks, Jillian. There are just 11 days until Keaton Slovis is back throwing touchdowns. USC football lost big name wide receiver Michael Pittman Jr. last year. But tight end Eric Kromenhoek is ready to step up and bring the ball into the end zone. We're not as deep at receiver as we have been, and that's going to be uh, an enhanced role in our offense. And I'm excited. I think we're going to get um, a lot more opportunities on the outside than we have in the past. New tight ends coach John David Baker will certainly help Kromenhoek and the tight ends increase their role. Baker says he feels the group is more prepared than he expected and wants to continue to develop their skills. To me, it's it's finding those kind of hybrid type guys that you can put back there and, and use them in the run game, but also split them out wide. It just it creates creates mismatches and allows you to play at a certain tempo if that guy's able to stay on the field the whole time. A high tempo USC offense could be scary for opposing teams. I think Kerwin Hoke and the Titans will be the X factor for the Trojans this year. We'll see what they can bring to the field November seventh against ASU. That's it for sports. Back to you, Zoe and Ella. It's an extremely stressful time for students right now, and it doesn't seem to be getting much better. So for this week's BRB segment, I sat down with a USC mindfulness teacher to talk about strategies for dealing with stress. Today, I am joined by our mindfulness expert, Elliot Law, who established and leads Mindfulness USC practice group here at USC. Elliot, thank you so much for coming on with me. I just want to start off um, by asking how you think mindfulness can help students during this very stressful time, especially considering online classes continue to take a toll. Um, leading into next semester, we don't really know what's going on. How can mindfulness help students? You know, first off, thank you so much, Zoe, for having me. Really happy to be here. And I think mindfulness can really be helpful in, in several ways. We're dealing with so many um, unusual stressors these days. And mindfulness, one of the functions of it is to allow people to kind of gain some space around maybe um, difficult ruminations or difficult emotions. Kind of being able to see that in a less reactive way and kind of look at it with curiosity as opposed to judgment. So Mindful USC uh, leads practice groups and I lead the one that's on Wednesdays. It's from 12.05 to 12.35 every Wednesday. It's drop in, uh, any level is welcome. You don't have to have any experience or you can have a lot. Um, basically we just do some mindfulness practice. It's about a 20 minute practice or so. And then there's time for a little bit of um, getting to know each other 
Let's do a little preview for our viewers. Um, a little quick mindful break. Is there anything we can do together uh, real quick? Most definitely. Let's just do a quick, what I'll call just a quick settling exercise. And we can begin by just finding a comfortable position. So really settle in to your seat. If you'd like, you can place one hand on your belly just to feel the connection there. Maybe one hand on the chest. Just take a moment to acknowledge your efforts. One of the things we're practicing in mindfulness is compassion for self, as well as compassion for others. Zoe, I don't know about you, but I feel so calm, so relaxed. It's been such a busy day. So thank you for showing me what Elliot taught you. It's such a good way to start off your day or if you need a quick mindful break in between classes, seriously. Totally. Well, I think that wraps it up for us on this Tuesday night. From all of us here at Annenberg TV News, have a good night.